I have the pleasure to have Frank Peters here in my show. And Frank is getting got up at 7.30 in the morning at L.A. to basically talk to me here at uh, 5.30 at, uh, or 4.30 at, uh, in the afternoon in Amsterdam. Frank, good morning. Good morning, Vincent. <laughs> and happy to join you this morning. Yeah, well, we just met each other in Amsterdam. You were over for Get in the Ring, an event with 200 startups, and you were on the jury. You were, you re everybody remembers you because you were extraordinarily critical, a little bit of a grumpy old man who were saying all these questions which the, the startups didn't know uh, how to answer. So where does that come from? Is that character or is it experience? Well, uh, it's probably experience because, you know, I've seen, I don't know, a thousand entrepreneurs pitch over the years. I've been an angel investor since 1999. I sold my company in 1998. I wrote software for Wall Street. That's how I got to be an angel investor. It was my second company that I started and it was very good timing. It was the boom of the personal computer age and mm. I had a uh, Windows-based product and Wall Street was moving to the Windows platform, and uh, anyway, and this was, that was 1998. A, you sold your company. I you sold made my software company. for Wall Street. So, you, and how long have you been working on that company? I ran it for 15 years. So, okay, it so was, it was not built in, in three years to bang. It was a slowly, slowly right. but surely moving. And yeah. how did you get? And how did you get into this uh, in 1990? So 1998, you sold it. So in, in 1984, right. when the IBM PC came out, when I started my company, you started too. And how did you get into the software business for Wall Street? Well, I was, of course, writing software just before the IBM PC came out. So even earlier than that, on a different what? computer. But I had a background in software. But, you know, that was all mainframes, so that didn't do me a lot of good. I wasn't well suited for those big corporate environments. I found myself in one of the very earliest uh, computer stores uh, selling computers. Of course, just like today, you know, the hot electronics like an iPad, every business person that walked into the store yeah. wanted one. They just needed an excuse to buy it. And because I had the capability of writing software too, I was able to uh, find some, you know, clients, just individuals there where I was writing software but for did them. Did you live in uh, New York? Because now you no, live in L.A. Right. and you were on Wall working for Wall Street. Yeah, I learned uh, the hard way that I was living in Los Angeles and all the customers, of course, all the big customers were in New York. But in the very earliest of days, I was selling software one copy at a time. So I was, you know, I would say I would uh, write software all night, then get in my car at noontime and drive around Los Angeles selling one copy at a time <laughs> out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> so that was hard Hardcore. work. And it was only later, you know, eight, nine, ten years later that Wall Street started calling and they wanted, of course, you know, uh, enterprise-wide licenses. And, of mm -hmm. course, that's when the company really grew tremendously. And uh, I was fortunate. I had a good board of directors, and we groomed the company for several years to sell it. So Yeah, and you sold well. in 1999, just before the big crash. Yeah. So you sold on the high of the market. Well, you know what I always say is I sold just in time to invest heavily in the uh, Internet bubble. <laughs> so that so part wasn't so great. Yeah, I learned okay, how to so do you that basically, too. how much was the company? How, how much sales did the company have? And can you share with us how much you sold it for? Yeah, uh, the company had six million dollars in sales, and we sold it for um, somewhere in the mid twenties. So let's say four times oh. four times revenue. Oh, you can only dream sweet. of those kinds of numbers uh, in these days. And best of all, my brother and I had bootstrapped the company. Between the two of us, we owned over 90% of the company. So Poor when, guy. When Poor we guy. Sold that the was, company, that must we have were been really in, tough to have all that money and invest in other yes, companies. Yes, we, uh, we were well positioned then to become angel investors. But then, of course, um, a history lesson here. The dot-com bubble wiped out many, many, all the companies, almost all the companies that I was investing in at that time. 
Yeah. And so I took several years off. It wasn't until 2003, 2004 that I came back to angel investing. Mm -hmm. But in that time, I, I found in Los Angeles a very well-organized angel group. And I moved from being an individual, you know, out there talking to entrepreneurs. Anyway, I enjoyed very much the what we call the safety in numbers of working with an angel group where you get the benefit of observing your peers and seeing their reaction, the kind of questions they ask, you know, the, having people to share due diligence with. It was a much, you know, we would say safer environment to operate in as an investor. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally imagine. Um, I can totally imagine that. Then uh, I guess, well, uh, you got me going here. Then I eventually became chairman of the group in Los Angeles, Tech Coast Angels. Uh, we've often said largest angel group in the nation. And I was very fortunate. I moved up in the leadership, ran uh, the Orange County Network, and then had an opportunity to run the entire organization. And in that time period, What's just kind of coincidental is the European Business Angel Network, you know, based in Brussels, they started reaching out and making contact. They wanted to, uh, you know, kind of collaborate, share best practices. And I was in the leadership then, made a lot of contacts in EBAN. And that's in, in part how I ended up in Rotterdam last month is uh, through many of the friendships that have occurred. Um, yeah, because of that coincidence. Now we t we met last uh, we met uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, basically we had a talk about uh, inv the the investors, uh, the, the 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 VC world and the angel world, and you just floored me by explaining to me how unbelievable local it is. That even if you're inside California and you have a company, you're from Silicon Valley, and you come to LA, that that's not normally done. That that's right. That it is very, very localized. Well, especially in the example you just mentioned, like if if a deal came to us from Silicon Valley, we would sit there and say, you know, why can't you get this deal funded at home? Because that's, you know, ground zero, so to speak. There's a lot, so much money there. But there are just a handful of very large markets for angel investing. New York would be another one, Los Angeles, Boston. So there are uh, well-organized groups, lots of investors, and the whole process is systematized so that, uh, you know, if you've got a uh, worthy opportunity, you're mm -hmm. going to find all the money you need right at home. So that's, it's part of, I keep thinking, a density issue, right? Uh, Los Angeles is a huge city. So yeah. we span yeah, our... Yeah, it's the same. It's about the same size as, Amer as, as Holland. As Holland, yeah. Yeah, 16, 17 million people. Yeah, even larger, I believe. And we uh, have... Um, we are spread out across five major cities in Southern California here. So we have our own little syndicate. So anyway, um, and I suppose you have to acknowledge that there are more deals then there is money. So in some ways, it's a, buy, you know, it's a buyer's market when you're an angel investor. You look at a lot of deals. It wasn't the night that we met, but the next night I was presenting, <coughs> I was presenting in The Hague and I had my own slide deck. And in one of my slides, I have a, uh, what I call a drinking from a fire hose image. And uh -huh. you can probably picture yeah. that. In Los Angeles, we're getting hundreds of applicants every month, almost an unmanageable number of funding applicants that are local. Yeah, so you have, you have this system. You, you have a, basically a fire hose of uh, applications, but I still think there's value in, in, in differences. And if you have international investors in a company, that gives me more, more, uh, more trust that the judgment people have, they have different kinds of different kinds of uh, expertise, you know, you, because every business who you have nowadays needs to work internationally. Even if you're coming from America, America's a nice home market. But if you immediately start internationally, you have much more chance to make it later and you can learn from the different, uh, the, from the different continents. So well, I think there's, there is sure, strength, sure. there's strength 
in different nationalities and their strength in different kinds of investors. But so you know you where that me comes that into play, was an though. Absolute no, no. So that was well, for me a very good learning experience. You know what we're uh, one thing we're learning as we go is um, you know there every every startup comes back for more money. Mm -hmm. So if they're successful, they come back for more money. And what we learned in the early days is we would just hand that off to venture capital and kind of pat ourselves on the back for having picked another winner, not mm -hmm. realizing that in many cases uh, what was happening wasn't necessarily in our own best interest. One, we're going to be diluted terribly. And then two, venture capital just naturally, they have their own objectives. Only one out of 10 or two out of 10 of their portfolio companies are going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So it took us the better part of a decade to realize that we'd be better off trying to fund these companies in a second round ourselves, trying to get them further along. Uh, that's in our own best interest. So what's happening now, to some extent anyway, is companies that succeed in Los Angeles and come back for more money will potentially be well received if we sent them to Seattle or Boston or some of the other large markets where you know they they look you know uh, re more successful. It's a second round. There are a lot yeah. of qualities that an angel investor might find attractive at that stage. Yeah, interesting. Hey, now you have done. You are an angel investor from 1999, so that's uh, 13 years uh, from now. What is what would you describe as your lessons, uh, your expensive lessons learned? Well, uh, of course, they are expensive. I think uh, I've been. I think uh, somewhere along the line in all these years, 70% uh, of all my portfolio companies have uh, burned to the ground. I believe. I, I heard of just another one. I was at a Christmas party just last week, and I heard of another one that's going all the way to zero. And yet at the same time, out there in the other room, on the table, going out in the mail today, is a check for a new startup, brand new startup, um, based in Se But Portland, seven out of Oregon. ten is not that bad, is it? I mean, from startups, uh, because... I mean, I normally have eight or eighty or ninety percent of the startups basically don't make it, but uh, it just depends. How have you done on the other side? The 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 the, the, the bad no. side we all know, but yeah. uh, what about on the good side? You already no, said I have nothing you to need show to invest for, the second uh, round. That's important. Yeah, you don't right, immediately right. leave them to the venture capitalists because you're going to buy diluted. Right. Because these people are, they they know how to negotiate and they know how to do liquidity preferences and all kinds of things they exactly. put in that you get screwed on the back end. Yeah, and, and what, uh, what, what have just you so my venture capital part? friends understand, of course, uh, I'm not uh, bad mouthing them as much as that's just the nature of the business. That's Please. that's how you play that game. But uh, yeah, I have little to show right now. So I've been an angel investor for many years. And what's happening is I have just literally a handful of companies that have survived all these years and they're now in a position. I've had one IPO, ironically yielded nothing. And I have another IPO maybe next year up my sleeve that could, that could be successful. So it's taking much, much longer. It's taking 10 years or more, I think, uh, many people would agree to really grow. It's no different than when I started my business. It took 15 years, the better part of that 10 years yeah. to really grow the company to something substantial. So that hasn't really changed. In the meantime, some of these economic downturns have really hurt the startups. And uh, I've been caught up in that. So I uh, I have little well, to you were, show. You were not lucky. You basically were incredibly lucky in 1998 to sell it. But right. then, of course, that was a disaster, uh, the period till 2001, 2002. And now the 2008 crisis uh, has been hurting the startup too. And I think uh, we're probably skipping one. You know, they say it's like childbirth, these economic downturns. People wouldn't have more children if they remembered how painful it was. So we all want to forget. So there have been other economic downturns because I can remember. Anyway, okay, so, so what's going to happen? What's going to happen in your what's your next thing which you're going to do in 2013? 
And in the next couple of, uh, so what is your next thing, uh, Frank? Well, I told you, I'm writing a check right now for a startup that uh, one of my board members, go all the way back to my company, one of my board members, he's been very successful over the years, and he's starting a brand new company. So it's it's more based on trust and wanting to, what would you say, hitch my wagon to his success and of course, you're never sure if his next venture is going to be successful, but I want to be a part of it. In part, right. for a lot of reasons. I owe him so much what he contributed to my success. And two, the trust is is as high as it gets, right? Uh, it's like family. Which Do you want to share the name of the company? Well, it's brand new. It, I don't believe it even has a website yet. So it's that early... It, so, Early stage. Uh, it has to do with uh, crowdfunding, though. It's mm. a crowdfunding. It's a different twist on crowdfunding. Uh, interesting twist. And I'll have more to share about that on my show in the weeks and months ahead. Okay, well, I just bought this thing here. It's interesting. It's a crowd, uh, crowdfunding in a different way. You basically, it's an iPad, iPhone uh, thing, putting it on a video uh, on a tripod. And, um, you know, it was like 20 bucks. And these guys, you know, sold 5,000 of them. Oh, you have them too. Great. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> How can you live without these? It was the first thing these? I bought online through a crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsourcing experience. Um, I've, ordered a, I've ordered a lot, but they, a lot of them didn't arrive. So mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll talk to you more when you, um, when you have something to, to, to tell us. And the first thing we're going to do is get you back to Holland. And I'm, I'm going to do my best to come to L.A. Uh, in 2013. Sounds like a good idea. You come back to Holland and I come to L.A. Sounds good. I can't wait to return, Vincent. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. And Bye -bye. I'll listen to the Frank Peter Show. Everybody, listen to the Frank Peter Show because it is, you find anybody there who has anything to do with angel investment. You'll learn a lot every week. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent.